Today we're going to be learning a Ravin Daf Samach. Um, today's shear is dedicated by Gary Zeitlin in honor of Dr. Earl Zeitlin. Happy birthday and gratitude for his many years as a tirelessly devoted neurologist, father, and grandfather. And to Ellen Siegel in honor of her 60th birthday with love from your children and grandchildren. Ima, your devotion to Limud Daf Yomi fills us with pride and inspiration. Your example teaches us that we should always make time in our busy lives for Torah and for learning. Hashem bless us all with many more years with you, full of health, growth, happiness, and limud Torah. So happy birthday to everybody there. And uh, we will get started with our daf. So Eruvin daf six, daf samach, daf 60. We are now going to start, we finished yesterday, we'll go back for a quick minute. We had a question of Rabbi Ami Barada Harpanya, who asked Rabbi, what is the situation with a ladder? How is a ladder viewed, right? Very interesting question. If you have a ladder that connects between two things, on the one hand, you could say a ladder maybe functions as a type of separation barrier. On the other hand, you could say it, it, it functions as an opening between two. Now, again, let's just review a few rules. If between two courtyards or spaces or anything, well, whether it's alleys or whatever it might be, and we're gonna see this a lot today, there's a separation of a wall or something that separates where there's no entrance or opening in the wall or not a big enough one, which we'll talk about. Then one does not forbid the other from making a separate A roof, right? Remember, we like, let's go back to our original case of five people in a courtyard and one decides not to be part of the A roof. So if that person didn't exit his house through the courtyard, he wouldn't forbid all the other people in the courtyard because there's a separation and he's considered a separate unit. So that's what we were talking about yesterday. Rabbi said to him, in the name of Rabbi, it was said, Sulam Torah Peta Halav. It's considered like an opening, okay? Because it it's an, it's, makes it accessible to get from one to the other, which would mean it would be a problem, let's say, two courtyards that have, uh, right? The, actually, the question was asked, um, sorry, I forgot. The question was asked about a city, about a different issue. If you have a city with the main drag, open on one side with a ladder, a wall, but a ladder that you could climb up to get out the city on the other. Is that considered open or not? Rabbi says it's considered open. And comes Rav Nachman and he said, Lo very strongly, don't listen to him. This is not true. Okay, we're five lines from the bottom of Nun Tedem a bit. Rav Ada said in the name of Rav, you were quoting Rav, but you missed part of what he said. He said, really what Rav said was, Sulam It depends on the situation. And in fact, what does it depend on? Well, since we learned you can always be more lenient when it comes to Eruv. So we're going to be the most lenient possible. So in this case, where we're going to be more lenient if we say it actually functions as a wall. There's a wall there. The Sulam doesn't open up that wall. It's not super accessible to climb out of your city through a ladder. Therefore, we're going to call it That's Kedamaran, like the situation you just described. Torat Petahalav but if you're going to have a ladder between two courtyards, then we're going to say, then we call it an opening because, right, then we're going to allow the, and now an opening in what sense? An opening could be a good thing or a bad thing because an opening could mean, so we'll see right now, it's an opening in the sense that we can say you can make an error between the two of you because if there's a wall and as a wall means two things, wall means you can't make an error. You're two separate units. You can't make an error between the two of you. Let's say I want to carry to my friend's house. But if we have a big wall, we're not allowed to make an error together. So wall means no, but if you have a ladder, you can view it as if, yes, we can. On the other hand, let's say I made an error in my courtyard with my friends and your courtyard backs on mine, but with a wall and there's a ladder. Well, we can view that as you didn't join our error. You're not going to mess us up because let's say we're all part of the same, you know, whatever it might be. Well, you're not going to mess us up because we do have a wall, even though there's a ladder. So you can go any way you want to be lenient. Well, now we're going to question this because Rav Nachman said this. And now they say, wait a minute. Does Rav Nachman really say that we're going to always be lenient with a ladder? Didn't he say in the name of Shmuel? And remember that he said in the name of Shmuel, because soon we're going to have, okay, in case you don't get this whole sugya right now that we're learning right now, we're going to repeat it in another three minutes, because we're going to have the same thing with Shmuel. First, they're questioning Rav Nachman from the statement of his. Then we're going to say Shmuel says something, and also we're going to question him from here. On Chatzer on Shemer Pesach. Okay, we'll bring you to a picture now, although the picture only, you have to kind of look at the picture without all the details of the picture, and I'll tell you which ones you have to ignore, because the picture only gives you according to the answer. 
But imagine, so here we have a merpeset, which is a, basically a porch out of side this house. And it's, there's a courtyard below, okay? Now, here it says, pahot ten. okay? The height of the, of the merpeset, of the porch is very low. But really right now we assume the porch is high. We're gonna assume it's at least 10 tfachim off the ground, which is always right, 10 tfachim is the height of a wall. So imagine it's much taller than it says. We have this merpeset and the chatzir. So shachachu velo irvu. Let's say the people in the courtyard and the people in the, in the porch forgot, or the house really, it's really the porch that leads to this house, forgot to make an Eruv together. In yesh lefnehem daka arba'a, remember we talked about a daka the other day? It's some sort of um, barrier, a little small thing that basically sets the two aside. And you see the way they put the barrier. It's, you can see it, it says daka here. It's right at the bottom of the ladder. Okay, they didn't tell us this, but it's obvious. Otherwise this wouldn't be relevant. There's a ladder from which you get from the courtyard to the porch. So if at the bottom, the base of the daka, the, uh, at the ladder, there's a daka, which basically means that the people in the porch are saying, we don't really want anyone from downstairs that doesn't belong here, that doesn't live here, coming into our space. Then, then it's great. The people in the courtyard made an Arab, the people in the house upstairs from this present weren't part of the Arab. That doesn't matter because they already said, we want to be separate from you. We had this the other day where the Daka was put in the Mavoy entrances, and that meant that we don't want to be together with anybody else. And therefore, they, if you're not going to be with them, well, then you don't forbid them if you didn't join their Arab. The im lav, but if you didn't have this dakan, this is the important part for our purposes, o seret. Then the people on the top didn't join the chatzar at the bottom. They're going to forbid them, okay, without the daka. Now, why? Why is this a problem? Because if we have this ladder here, so the ladder should function like a wall, as we said. If the ladder functions like a wall, it, and it's, what did Rav Nachman say? Rav Nachman said, we're going to use it to be lenient in any direction we need. So in this case, we'd rather say the ladder functions like a wall. If the ladder functions like a wall. It can block, right? These are two separate spaces and one shouldn't forbid the other. But here we say the ladder's not enough. You need a daka. So Rav Nachman seems to be stringent here and treats the ladder as an opening, as petah. So the Gemara says, it must be a case where the ladder can't function like a wall. What would that be? Now we get to the picture. The merpeset, and by the way, you see there's a wall here in this picture. Imagine that wall isn't there either. We're only going to get to that later. So imagine the merpeset is wide open and it leads to the courtyard. So they say it must be, it's lower than 10. That's why even if the, the ladder were to function like a wall, it's not a halachic wall because it's not 10 fucking tall. And that's why they're not considered separate. And you can imagine if it's so low on the ground, it's really like one is open to the other and you could see why they were forbid each other unless you put up this daka. So now they say, wait, but if that's the case, if it's not 10 tall, then the daka shouldn't help you. It's low down. It's really in the same domain as the chatzir. They should forbid each other. Even if you, the fact that you put up this little daka, that shouldn't really do anything for you. So what do they answer? Okay, you have to find a case where the daka is going to help you. So what's the case? It's migufet, it means it has a wall around it. The merpeset, now we're going to learn the porch had a wall. So now we get to this entire picture. See, there's walls around the side and the front of the porch. So it has walls. But what happened? The walls are breached by 10, uh, more than 10 cubits. Okay, you see this breach here where the ladder is? Actually, it looks like a kind of small breach, but it's more than 10 amo. That's what it said, ad eser amo. Okay, until 10. So now, what does that mean? The cave, right? Once you have a 10 opening, it's a problem. Remember, we had walls that have a 10 of opening. They're considered open. So now this is open. But But the daka closes up the entrance. So because it has a wall, and even though the wall is breached, 10 amot, where the daka kind of closes up that breach and tells us that, oh, we don't want you coming into our space. And therefore, since it has this wall, now the wall, by the way, has to be more than 10 tfachim. So what's not 10 tfachim? The height of the bottom of the porch, right? And that's why it's considered connected to the chatzir. But once it has a wall, it's considered separate, but the wall is not enough because the wall is breached by 10 cubits. So again, this is quite like, uh, there's a lot of parts to this. 
But that's why the picture is very helpful. But once you put up that taka, it kind of says, listen, we're closing up the breach in our wall and you shouldn't come into us. And that's why it will be allowed. If you don't have the taka, then because even though it has a wall, it's still open. And now what's the whole point of all this? The sulam, the ladder is totally not relevant to the picture here because the ladder itself is less than 10 tfachin because, right? Because the height of the mirpeset, the porch is less than 10 tfachin. So that's why the, the ladder is not the wall. That's not what's important here. And we basically explained it. It's a totally different issue. It's the same issue, but it's different walls that we're talking about and not the ladder. And therefore it's not a question of Rav Nachman. Okay, moving on. Let's say you have a wall, next picture, 224. You have a wall between two courtyards, but you cover the entire wall with ladders. Okay, now, even if the wall is more than 10 amo, which means basically you're kind of creating a breach in the wall because instead of having a wall separated, we now have accessibility from one to the other. We can basically call this a machitza. Okay, which again is the same thing. Now, Shmuel, we're saying it in the name of Shmuel. It's the same thing Rav Nachman's saying, which is we're going to view these ladders to help us in either which way we want. So even though theoretically it's open, because you can get, it's a, I would say instead of open, it's accessible. So accessible would mean our two courtyards are accessible, so maybe we'd forbid each other. But no, they say to Rav Nachman, which means if I make my own error, you can't forbid me because we have a wall between us, even though it's covered with ladders. So here you see, we go lenient with the ladders. So now again, we're going to have the same question. They were in the wine press of Rav Hanina. And Rav Brona asked Rav Yehuda, right? You just, we've seen this before where they get into a lachic discussion while they're in the wine press. He asked him, Does Shmuel really say you could treat it as a mechitza? Right? If not, it's going to be forbidden because, again, what are we viewing the ladder in this case? If you didn't have the daka, the ladder, it would be forbidden because they can get from one to the other, right? Because through the ladder, the ladder makes it open. So now they say, again, and this is good review, let's go back to our previous picture. Right, where it's not 10 tfachim off the ground, meaning the ladder is not 10 tfachim. So even if you would theoretically call it a wall, which would then, right, you want to say that it's, uh, it's accessible, right? We can't treat this ladder, right? It's going to be lower than 10 off the ground. And that's why what we're basically going to say is these are open to one another and it's going to be forbidden unless you have the, the daka there. So now... Um, so it must be, it wasn't Gavoa Asara. Because again, we want to say the ladder is a machitza. If we say it's a machitza, then we'd, that's, that's what Shmuel said, that you can view it as a machitza. Then what would happen? If it's a machitza, then they wouldn't forbid each other. This says they're going to forbid each other unless you have the daka. But if you just have the ladder, then they're going to forbid each other. So that seems to go against what we said before. So now we're going to say the ilo gavomer pesed asara ki avid daka mai have. What does it help you if it doesn't? It's not gavom asara. The daka shouldn't help you because again, this is one open right into the other. They're in the same domain because it's not ten tefachim off the ground, and therefore it shouldn't even help you having the daka. It's basically we should forbid it no matter what. It should be forbidden. So the answer of being gufefet at esar amod it must be the merpesed itself. The porch had its own wall that was ten tefachim high. But then because, right, and then it was breached by up to 10, by 10 amot, but because you put the daka down, it kind of closes off the breach, in which case we're going to say it's enclosed and it's separate, but not having anything to do with the latter, which answers our question. Okay, starting now another section. If you remember, we were talking in the Mishnah about an ir she'yachi v'naseh shorabim and shorabim v'naseh shorabim. If you have a city that had a lot of people, let's say according to Rashi, 600,000, and then it turned into an Ir Sheyachid and ended up with a much smaller population, what do you do since we always still think of it as an Ir Gdola, Ir Sharabim? We have to aim Arvin et Kula, according to the Mishnah, Elen Kena Sala Chutza Ki Ir Chadashash Biyuda Shiesha Chamishim Diorim. You have to make it, you have to basically say that we're going to keep 
a part of the city separate outside the Eruv so that people remember, right? So the people think, like realize that this used to be an Eir Shavabim, but it's no longer anymore. So you have to, because it was originally an Eir Shavabim, you still need to have, you basically need to take a section and leave it outside. So now we're going to have a whole story about this. And it's actually going to be very interesting from a certain perspective, you'll see. Um, so now we start off with this question, B'nai Kakunai. There was an actual case, the B'nai Kakunai, Ati the Kamei Rav Yosef. They come before Rav Yosef. They were an ear that used to be Shorabim, and now they're Shel Yachid. Okay, it used to be a very populated city. Now it's not so populated anymore. Amrule Havlan Gavra de Arev Lamata. So they go to Rav Yosef and they said, please bring us someone that can make an Arab for a city. We want to do it right. Amale Labayis, Rav Yosef says to Abaye, Zil Arev Lehu. That would have been interesting if he had just stopped here. He says, go put up an Arab for these people. But what does he say? He adds the following words, which causes Abaye a lot of, uh, we'll see a lot of, I don't know what the word is, but you'll see. Make sure that you don't do something that you're going to get people angry about, okay? And that they're not going to come screaming at the Beit Midrash, what did you do? It's a very interesting thing he says. He's basically telling him, be very careful about how you figure out how to do this, okay? So, so he goes to assess the city and he sees that there's this whole section of, of houses that all faced the river, it was a city on a river. And he says, all these houses face the river, none of them lead out to the public domain, which means what? Well, we saw before, this goes back to how we started. I told you we're gonna talk about a lot about this machitza today. These houses don't have any entranceway to the city. So that means they can't really do an Arab with the city because if they don't have any opening toward the city, then you can't include them in your Arab because they only open to the river. So he says, oh, Amar, hane le shiur lamata. Those are the perfect, you know, as if you're gonna, it's a little tricky in the city. And so now you can see why maybe Rav Yosef said, be careful, you don't get people angry because who are you gonna exclude? Think about it, right? Imagine you're living in a city where there's an Arab and your house is outside the Arab. You're gonna be pretty angry about that. So at least at first glance, it seems like maybe this is why people would be angry. So he thinks, well, I'll take those people and I'll take them out of the city. Why? They're the perfect candidates because they can't be in the Arab anyway because they have this wall. So they won't get upset with me that I'm leaving them out. And it's perfect, I'll fix the city in that way. So he says, right, so I'll use those people. But he, no, what's the problem? He has in his head thinking, Rabbi Yosef told him, make sure nobody gets upset and they're not gonna start complaining of the Beit Midrash. So he's, he's thinking and rethinking what he does. And you're gonna see he rethinks it, I don't remember how many times, but a lot of times. Hadar Amar, he says, wait a minute, it says you can't use the whole city. You have to leave something out. From here you can infer what? Wait, you can't leave out something that couldn't have been part of the Arab in the first place. You have to leave out a section that could have theoretically been part of the Arab. So that's not going to count as leaving them out because they couldn't have even been in the Arab. It sounds like from the Mishnah, you can't be Mare of the whole city that you would have done an Arab around, meaning only this people. You have to leave out some sort of section that could have potentially been part of the Arab. So what's his thought? He says, okay, so what can I do? I'll make windows in the houses of those people on the back side of their houses that open to the public domain which means there'll be an access route, which means theoretically they could have been part of the Eruv and now I can leave them out of the Eruv. So I'll make them windows. Because if they wanted to make an Eruv through the windows, they could have. And then they'll be theoretically part of the city, but then I'll leave them out and that's perfect. Okay. But right before you're gonna start making holes in somebody's wall, you better figure out that this is really gonna help you. So he says, Hadaram, or wait a minute. He says, ah, low by, I don't need to make windows. Why? Because now I realized there was some case I just remembered. Taha Rabba Baravua, and we actually learned this before. He took the whole city of Machosa, and instead of making an Arab around the whole city, he made an Arab for each alleyway by itself. If you, you see, I have a picture in, the, in, my, in the regular Gemara, there's a picture in Rashi about this, at least in my version, um, which is there's Mavoy, 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 strips of it. And in between each one, we're going to see in a second, Mishum Pera de Beitori. There was the food that the oxen ate, that they would put the, they dug these ditches in between every alleyway, it was a deep ditch, there was 10 Tvachim deep, which means 
again, a deep ditch could function like a wall. So there were walls in between each mavoi. So we couldn't do an Erev in the whole city. He did each mavoi by itself. And then in between each were these walls. And that's why he didn't do them together. So there's a case where they couldn't have been in an Erev together with each other. It's the same exact thing here because there were walls in between. And, but he did the whole city in this way, even though we're going to learn now, Mechoza was a city that was once Shel Rabim. Now it's Shel Yachid. So theoretically, you had to do Shior. But where's the Shior here? Well, he says, Each Mavoi itself was considered a remainder for the other, right? Since each one wasn't together with the other, they were each considered, oh, well, we have an Erev without you, and we have an Erev without you. So it works for Shior, even though they couldn't have made an Erev together. Ah, so perfect. Here we have a case. Now I don't have to make windows. I can leave these people aside. They can be the ones that are the shiur, the leftovers, the remainder, the part that's outside the Erev, even though theoretically they couldn't have been part of the Erev. Ah, because we see in Mechosa, that's what they did. And even though if they wanted to have done an Erev there in Mechosa, they couldn't have, yet we could still count it as the outside part. But he rethinks this again and says, Hadar Amar, Lo Dami, these cases aren't similar. Why not? Well, there's a difference between a wall that goes on the houses, like in his city, versus in Mechoza, where the wall was in the ground, okay? It was a ditch, because uh, if, you wanted, if you wanted to, in that city of Mechoza, you could have connected them through the roofs, okay? So there was a way to actually theoretically connect them by a roof, even though they weren't, but you could have, and there, but Hane Loma Arve, but here, these houses have a big tall wall, right? There's no way to get an Eruv going from them. So therefore he goes back to square one, Hilkach Nalav Din Kave. So let's make windows in this house, or not really square one, he goes back to option two, right? So option number one was just keep them out. Option number two is let's make windows. But one more last rethinking, Hadar Amar Kave Nami Lobaya. Actually, I don't need to make windows, why? Dahu Beit Tivna. He remembers another case. There was a Beit Tevin, a storage house of, of uh, straw. Now, storage house of straw isn't part of the area. If you didn't include that, it's not like anybody lives there. So it's not a problem. But Havile Lamar Bar Pupadita, Mi Pupadita, it sounds like a joke, right? Pupadita that lived in Pupadita. Okay. He owned this storage house. The Shavia Shiro the Pupadita. And it counted as the remainder for Pupadita. Some people say, what are you talking about? You need more than just a storage house, okay? And that's an aside. Some people say it was just one of the, let's say you go with three Chatzay Road with two houses in each of them, which we're going to see later that we pass on like Rabbi Shimon, or maybe we pass on like someone else entirely that we haven't even seen. But you could say that was one of the structures that counted, okay? That's some people's answers. Other people's answers use this to say, this supports the more lenient opinion that we're going to quote later. Anyway, that's just an aside. The main point here for what we're saying is that that storage house counted as sheer, even though it's not technically part of the Eruv because it's not a big dira, it's not a place where people live. So what do you see? It doesn't have to be part of the Eruv you know, in order to make it a shiur. And therefore he decided, I'm gonna keep this section, I'm gonna keep them out of the Eruv and I don't even need to make windows. Amar, hainu da Amar Limar. And then he says, ah, this is what he's told me, Rav Yosef, Make sure, right, that people don't get angry with you. So now the assumption is that he's basically saying, ah, they would have gotten angry with me had I punched holes in their wall, right? If I made these windows and then I didn't even need to, right? I was thinking of a situation. I had a neighbor who asked me to do something that it was affecting something and I had to, had to take care of something in my property that was affecting something in their property and I had to put out money. In the end, it didn't even resolve their issue. Right. So that's like the same thing here where, you know, here you're telling people make windows in your house and it doesn't even really do anything for you. So he says, now I know why he was telling me to be careful. First, we thought maybe because he was excluding them. Right. But then, right, because you're leaving someone out of the area. But it turns out something even worse. You might have punched holes in people's walls. You know, you don't want to start destroying their houses when it doesn't even do anything for you. And here you learn that before you make any changes or any big things, right, Think it through clearly, make sure it's really going to help you. Otherwise, it's really going to, um, you know, mess people up. I saw someone wrote, what about the 50 people? We'll see. First of all, there's different opinions. Maybe there were 50 people living in that section, or maybe we held like one of the other opinions that we're going to see that we don't really hold that you need 50 people. 
So now we're quoting the next line. The Mishnah, you have to make a section that's outside, like the Ir Chadasha, which has 50 people living there. Tanya. So now we're going to see a brighter that, that elaborates a little bit more on Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. Tanya, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Ir HaTaitab Yehuda, there was a city in Yehuda, Chadasha Shema, Bayuba, Chamishim Georim. There were 50 people living there. Anashim, Anashim, Vitaf, you see it. Not that you would have thought this, but in case you thought it was only men, no, it's right, anybody living there. Women, children included. And this is how they would determine the amount that you would need to leave things over. Or this would be considered a remainder. Now they ask a classic question. This is like, how do you order a telephone if you don't have a telephone to call to order, right? So like, how do you, right? So what about the ear chadasha itself? Chadasha mahu. If you have a sit, right? So chadasha, how did they do an eruv? If they were only 50 and that's your minimum, right, to leave out, how are they going to write the assumption, I guess, is that Chadasha was a city that was once bigger and now had less people. So what, how would they, what kind of shiur would they do? So they say, Chadasha, ki echidi iu ha v'shiur l'gdola, g'dola na mea v'shiur l'ktana. What do you mean? Chadasha was the remainder, Chadasha was the remainder for the city it was right next door to, right? They were considered like one unit. So therefore, when the big city made the Eruv, Chadasha was their remainder. When Chadasha made an Eruv for Chadasha, the big city was the remainder. So that's fine. What do you mean? That's not even a question. So they say, no, what we meant was, what if you have a small city like Chadasha, okay, which again was big and now is small, only 50 people living there. And now you want to make an Arab in that city and there's no other cities right next to it. So what do we do? So they say, one says it needs, you need to leave something out. In other words, maybe it's proportional, okay? If it's a city of only 50, well, then you leave out some other small amount, but you need something. You still need something left over. And some people say, no, if it's that small, then you already don't need any remainder. The whole idea of a remainder is because it's a big city. This isn't a big city, so you don't need it. Now back to Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon Omer Shalosh Chatzero with two houses each. So Amar of Chama Bergulia, Amar Rav, Halacha ke Rabbi Shimon. We pass on like Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Yitzchak Amar, Afil Bayit Echad Vechatzer Achat. Even one house and one courtyard. Now the way they understand Rabbi Yitzchak, first of all, Rabbi Yitzchak is generally an Amora. Okay, so it's a little bit strange because he's saying something that doesn't match either of the Tanaitic opinions. And the other thing that's strange about him is that he says one house and one Chatzer. I was thinking of Monopoly, right? You have a hotel and a house, right? It's like, that's what you do. So then they say, What's a chatzer without, right? You can't get a hotel without having houses, right? In other words, you, what's a, what's a, a courtyard without a house? It, it doesn't make any sense. The whole idea is someone's living there. So it doesn't make any sense. They just say, no, what he really meant was one house in, in a, one courtyard with one house in it. That's enough to leave out. So that's a very lenient opinion. Amar le'abay le'rav Yosef. Hadu Rabbi Yitzchak Gemara o Sfara. Did he get this through tradition? Because we didn't learn any Tanaitic sources about this. We had three courtyards with two houses each, or we had 50 people. Where did he get this from? Or is it Sfaro? Is it just logical that you need some sort of something to be out? And again, think about it. You really don't want to leave too many people out of the air if it's kind of annoying for them. So he wanted to have the most lenient opinion. So did he come up with this on his own, or did he have a tradition about it? Samarle, famous line. We've had this a few times already. My nakalamina, what's the difference? Whether he learned it from a tradition or he made it up on his own. And some people say, because anyway, we don't paskin like him. So who really cares? Okay, we don't paskin like him because he disagrees with Tanin. Interestingly, before I even finish, the Rif and some others say, no, no, no. First of all, they claim, some people claim we paskin like him. And why do we paskin like him? Because we always go by the most lenient opinion. Even though he's in Amoru, disagrees with Tanin, we still hold like him. Other people claim that he was a Tana. I think the Rif says it, that he was actually a Tana. Rabbi Yitzchak was a Tana, not an Amora from Israel. He was actually a Tana. He lived in the Tanaitic time period, and therefore this is a third Tanaitic opinion. Okay, it's, I'm, I didn't look it up whether we really see any statements of Rabbi Yitzchak, but usually Rabbi Yitzchak is an Amora from Israel. But anyway, they paskin like him because they say he's a Tana, and we're going to go by the lenient opinion. If you say it's an Amora, it's a little bit difficult. But either which way, whether we pot, you know, either he's saying we don't hold that way, so who really cares, or even if we hold that way, what's the difference whether he came up with it by his own logic or he had a tradition about it? So Amar, so what's Abai's answer? Amar le, Gemara, Gemara, Zamora, What you want my learning just to be a song? People sing songs all the time and they don't know, they don't understand the words, right? Sometimes, right? I, I probably brought this example, but 
I always think about this when my daughter was in this hip hop class and she would come home, she was five years old and singing these songs that were totally inappropriate. And you know, she had no idea what she was singing, right? People sing songs and they don't ever think about the words, right? Often you're singing words to songs. And, and anyway, so she, uh, so he says, the Gemara is not like that where we're just singing words without really understanding them. I wanna understand. That's what, right? I live to learn. What is learning all about? It's about understanding what you're learning, even if there's no ramifications halachically. That's not what the Gemara is all about. Good line. Okay, new Mishnah. Now we're back. Okay, there's something very strange here, which I didn't actually, um, I didn't actually understand why this is. And I think a lot ask questions about this. I didn't have a chance to check out different answers, but we basically were talking all about Erev Tchumen. And I said this when we got to the last mission, and then all of a sudden we get into Erev Chatzerot. And now we're going back to Erev Tchumen. That mission seems kind of out of place, okay? Um, I saw someone said there's an associative connection, but I didn't really see such an associative connection between the Mishnah and you know what was going on. So anyway, we, we kind of got off topic into Erev Chatzerot. We're now back to Erev Tchumen. Mishaya b'mizrach, v'amar l'beno, arev li b'marav. What we're going to learn in this Mishnah is Okay, we never talked about this before. When you want to be Konesh Vita somewhere, you want to say, that's where I want to be. It has to be within 2000 Amud of where you are right now. You can't make an Eruv if you're physically not within 2000 cubits of the space. Okay, which means based, right? So now what happens? Mishaya b'mizrach, v'amar l'beno, arev li b'marav. He's standing on the east side of, okay, we'll talk about maybe the east side of the city. We're going to have to understand this mission a little better. The Gemara is going to go into it. He's on the east and he says to his son, go make an error for me on the west side, outside the city on the west. Or or it's flipped, doesn't really matter. They wanna make sure you don't think it's only one direction. If where he's standing on the Mizrach, on the east, he has 2,000 amo to his house, he can go home. But if it's more than 2,000 amo to his a roof, he can't, where he says to his son, make an Eruv for me there. He can't go to that Eruv. That's not an effective Eruv because he's too far away right now. And he says to his son to do it from that place. So we can't be Konish Vita there. But what's interesting about this is he doesn't lose his house being his Shvita. Okay, where we saw in other cases where if you're on the way and you try to make a spot in the middle and it doesn't work, you don't get that and you don't get that. Remember we saw that? But that's because he wants to make an Arab in a place that's not his residence. Here it's his residence. So he can, if he doesn't have anything to fall back on, he can at least fall back on his residence because he's within 2000. There he wasn't within 2000 of his house. So he didn't have a house to fall back on because your house is always your default. So therefore he has his house. In that case, you were 4,000 from your house. So you couldn't do your house from afar. Um, you could have had your house if you didn't, right? Actually, I wonder if you could. Anyway, I'll leave that as a question. Okay, so now. Um, what if what if his house is more than 2,000 away from where he is, but his Eruv is closer? In other words, where he's telling his son to put the Eruv is closer to him than his house. We'll have to figure out what that is because if he's on the east and his son is on the west, his house is in the middle, it doesn't really make much sense. We'll have to explain this later somehow. Um, in this case, you can't go back to your house because your house is too far. Right? I guess that would explain there too, but you can't can't fall back on your house if you're not within 2,000 of your house. You have to be within 2,000 of your house to have your house as your fallback. But mutar le revo, you can go to his eruv. Hanotanet eruv, now we're moving on to a different topic. You're, you have your city. Remember, your eruv, you're, you're in your house. Let's say you get your city. What else do you get? 70 and two thirds of the ear, you get the, right, that part that is outside the city that's for the city's use. So you get 70 and two thirds. So let's say you put your eruv, the ibarashal ear, in that 70 and two thirds extra space. La Sava La Klub, that doesn't do anything for you because in any case, you got your city and the 70 and two thirds and we were only going to count 2,000 Amma from there. So you basically haven't done anything. Nitano Chutz Litchum, Afilu Amma Achat, if you put it outside your, your Tchum, even one Amma, let's say you walk out after the Yubu Ashel Ir, we're going to talk about. It sounds like you walk out outside the Tchum, outside 2,000 Amma. That for sure you can't do. So we're going to, the Gemara is going to say, it clearly doesn't mean that because you wouldn't get anything. You're already outside your tchum. You only get four cubits to walk and that's it. But here, if you put it one ama outside of the Iburashal Il, in other words, where we were going to start your 2000 ama, but you go and you put your air of one ama out there or any kind of space out there, mashiniskal hu mafsid. 
you're basically going to get space that way, and now you're going to lose space in the other direction. You basically moved your A roof outside of your, your tchum. We're going to talk about what this means when we get to the Gemara. Okay, starting with the beginning of the Gemara, Kasar Kadatach Mizrach Mizrach Beto, Marav Marav Beto. When we assume, what do they mean? The Mizrach means to the east of your house, and the Marav means to the west of your house, which makes sense for the first line, but not for the second line. Made sense, then we said, so you know, if you're on the east and your son's on the west and you have 2,000 to your house and then there's more to the Eruv, that makes perfect sense. You know, and then we could say, you, you can get reach your house, but you can't get to your Eruv. How could it possibly be a situation where you can get to your Eruv and you can't get to your house if your son is on the east side, the west side of the city, and you're on the east side of the city, or whatever it might be, right? Whichever direction you're going. So that can't possibly be. So we're going to have two possible answers. I'm a Rabbi Yitzchak, same Rabbi Yitzchak. Mi Savar, this is definitely Rabbi Yitzchak and Amora. Mi Savar, the Mizrach, the Mizrach Beto, the Marav, the Marav Beto. It doesn't mean one is to the east of his house and one is to the west of the house, which would obviously be that the one on the other side is obviously farther away from his house. You could say, him, his son, and the house. So basically he's saying, I'm more, um, right, whichever one we'd say, right, I'm east of my son, and, and my son is, I want him to put the Erev on the west side of where he is, right? I'm more to the east of him, he's more to the west, and our house, though, is further west. Okay, that could be a case. Here, let's pull up the pictures. Even if you say, here are some pictures of it, okay? These are, you don't really need pictures for this part, but this is the one that's a little bit more complicated. Okay, if you look at, right, we're now going to have like a triangle. Okay, where? Picture number 227. He's to the west and his son is to the east or whichever direction, but the house is, right, we're having like a triangle here. So the house is in a different direction entirely. And basically the distance between him and his son, one is more to the east, one is more to the west. That's less than 2,000 ama, but then the house is on a diagonal in a different direction. And that is gonna be um, more than 2,000 cubits. So it's not necessarily, we thought it was all there in a straight line. That's not the case. So I told you we had this problem because it said, if you put it, um, the next line really is if you put it outside the tchum, even one ama. So they say can't be you put it outside the tchum. No, that's not possible. So they say um, we meant outside the extra part. Now we have to. The last thing we have to figure out is this mashiniskal humafsi. What exactly does this mean? And we're going to have a problem with it. Mashiniskar the too low. In other words, what he gains. He, he loses on the other end and not anymore. The hot Tanya, wait a minute, doesn't it say? Now, remember, if you're in the city, what do you get? You get the whole city, another 70 and two thirds around the city, and then another 2,000 cubits in every direction, which actually is really 2,800 right on the, on the diagonal. But now you go one cubit outside the city, you no longer gain the city because you're now outside the city. The whole thing of the city is, right, you gain the whole city. So let's see what they say here. The hot Tanya, Okay, that line doesn't interest us. That was, we saw in the mission, it's not connected. But they're just quoting because it it's the beginning of the Brayat. Even one Ama, you gain that Ama, but now you lose that whole thing that you gained of having the whole city, right? And you can go 2,000 in every direction. You lost that now entirely. Because now you count, right? You're outside your city. You count 2,000 to the city and that's all you get, right? You might end up in the middle of the city, right? And, and you don't get the entire city. So you lose out. Now here in our mission, it said, you went at one ama, you lose one ama in the other direction. But that's not what it says here. So how do we explain this? So the Gemara says, a lokasya. And am I in the right place? One second. Um, see to call it your kula. We right. Okay. Lo kasha. Kan shakaltami dato b'chatzia il. Kan shakaltami dato b'sofa il. There's two different scenarios here, and we'll look at the pictures. So picture two twenty eight is you put your 
your Arab outside the city, when you now your city could have been 4,000 amo, let's say. So theoretically, you would have gotten, if you had stayed in your city, 4,000 cubits, right? And now you can go in every direction, another 2,000, right? Plus all the extras. Here, you made your Arab outside the city. When you count 2,000, you end up, where do your 2,000 bring you? To the center of the city, not all the way, not to the end of the city, because the city is big. In that case, that's what the Bright has said. You basically lose the city. It doesn't mean you lose the whole city. You get the first, you know, let's say you were a thousand ama outside the city and now a thousand ama into the city. So you gain a thousand cubits of the city, but you lose the rest of the city. That's going to be if your 2000 doesn't get you from your new Eruv through the city. That's one scenario. But the Mishnah, when it said Mash and Iskalum of city only loses whatever he went in that direction, but he gets it in the other direction. If, when you're measuring your Eruv, this is picture number 229. Okay, here they say it's a thousand ama outside the city. Then when you get to the city, you actually, the city, okay, here they've put it as like a narrow city, a narrow long city, and you're along the narrow line of the city. So you basically can go through the city and you're still, right? When you get to measure your 2000 from your Eruv, you already are outside the city on the other end. If that's the case, what happens? Then we go, okay, you have, then we're going to say, and I'll explain to you in a minute what this means. Let's read it in detail. Just like Rabbi Idi says, okay, this is a case where you're outside the city when you're when Shabbat starts and you get stuck somewhere. You basically are Koneshvita where you are. And how do you measure 2,000 cubits? You can't measure on Shabbat. So you take steps. You count your steps, right? You make each step. You measure approximately a cubit and you count your steps. If when you're modedu ba, vikaltami datoba chatsia ir, where did you end up when you got to step number 2000? In the center of the city, eloela chatsia ir. So all you get is half the city. That was the previous picture. Kaltami datoba sofa ir, but if you get to the end of the city, nase loa ir kula kedala ramot. So you're counting. And let's say you get up to step number 1,500 and you're already outside the city. Well, you have to hopefully remember where you were when you started in the city. And you basically, the entire city is like four amo. And you basically get, so if you were at, let's say a thousand when you got into the city and you got to 1,500 when you left the city, you erase those 500 from your count. Okay, some people say you erase them entirely. Some people say you substitute four because it's considered like your dalad amot. Dalad, the whole thing is four amot which means you can really walk the whole thing. Some people say, so you add four, so you're at 1,004, and then you get, and some people say, no, you just, Dalad Amod is just a phrase, a catchphrase. And really you go back to 1,000. And then when you're outside the city, you count another 1,000 from there. And that's what you see in picture number 229. That basically you get another two, another 1,000 on the other side of the city, okay? And that's what it means, right? Um, Okay, and then you basically finish up your count. So that's what it means, what he gained on that side, he loses on that side. So now he's got 1,000, let's say, okay, it's 1,000. He gets 1,000. If he had stayed in the city, he would have gotten 2,000 that way and 2,000 that way, right? Now he put his A roof, 1,000 in this direction. So he'll get, you know, 2,000 from wherever he did in every direction. But when he comes back to his city, he'll get still a thousand on one side of the city and the other thousand on the other side of the city. So when he gains on one side, he loses on the other because he doesn't get to go 2000 outside the city, but he does still get a thousand. Okay, so that's the difference between if you were to end in the middle of the city, then you wouldn't get the whole city. But if you end and you still have space and you can walk to the end of the city, then you get the whole city doesn't even count as part of the count. Well, here we're going to end with a very interesting line, and we'll finish today with this line. Amar of Edi, ain elu ela divrei neviut. That is just prophecies you're talking. Okay, now this statement could mean a few different things. So first of all, what's the difference between a prophet and, right, this comes up all the time, what's the difference between a prophet and a chacham? Right, a chacham, right, a prof, a chacham is not allowed to use prophecies in determining Halacha, right? That's a whole big thing. There's a whole difference between the Chacham and a Navi. A Navi, right? This is word straight from God. A Chacham, it's the opposite. Lo he, right? It's not in the heavens. Comes up with it on his own, uses logic, uses tradition, all different things. So some people say what he's basically saying is this, well, no matter how you read this, you're not, this is not logical what you're saying, is he basically saying. 
okay? It's not logical. It's like you're prophesizing about something, like you're talking out of nowhere almost, okay? So Tosfot says, he obviously means this l'sheva, okay? What he means is, klomal, ein chokma kazo shemivin l'chalek kol kach tzfara muetet. There's no way you could have come up with this on your own. It must be, he says, you must have said it, but Ruach HaKodesh. In other words, wow, you must be a prophet because there's no way you can come up with this on your own. So you must have heard this from God. Okay, because otherwise this, the idea that you would get the entire city makes absolutely no sense. Okay, that the whole city would be basically considered like nothing or like poor Amon and then you get to go out. It makes absolutely no sense, but you must have some sort of prophecy about this. That's one option. One option is to say, no, it's derogatory. And it's saying, this is for the world of Nevi'im maybe, but you know, there's no logic to what you're saying, okay? Because Nevi'im say things that we might not understand the logic and I don't understand the logic of what you're saying at all because you're like a prophet and it's said a little bit you know, facetiously and in the end, you know, we're gonna have to see how the conversation continues, okay? But basically he says, Mali Mali What's the difference for the Salacha, whether you end in the middle of the city or you end in the end of the city, why should that make a difference? Either you get the city or you don't get the city, it shouldn't matter whether you end in the middle or end in the beginning. So we'll stop here for now. We'll leave you hanging. Have a great day.